Well, thank you. It is great to be here. And uh, yes, I am a sailor, even though I grew up in that maritime center of the universe, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But we do have rivers, as do you. And uh, one of the things I learned very early on is back in the day, particularly in the 18th century, before there were multi-lane highways, before there were railroads, the only way to get around with any speed, especially if you were transporting an army or, and the provisions associated with them was by water. Water was everything. And all my books have a watery theme. Uh, even my book about uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn uh, begins with a riverboat on its way up the Missouri River to supply Custer's army with the provisions he needed. Never would, that battle would have never happened without, without the water. And I have to say, even given my interest in the water, I was very surprised at the incredible impact water, the lakes, the rivers, but especially the sea would have in the ultimate uh, direction of the American Revolution. Yes, I've, I've, this is my third book. The first is Bunker Hill, which focuses obviously on the beginnings in Boston. And there it was the British Navy's ability to control Boston Harbor that meant that even if they were surrounded uh, by patriot militiamen, uh, they could still get something to eat because they could get food by water. And the second book in that trilogy is uh, Valiant Ambition, which focuses on Benedict Arnold and Washington. And the, in that, it's the Hudson River. It really all comes, that was the waterway that goes north, south, uh, connects New York ultimately to Canada. If you follow Lake Champlain up a, a lake of river-like proportions, and it, it, the, the uh, climax of that book is when Arnold decides he is going to betray his country, and how is he going to do that? He is going to turn over West Point to the British on the Hudson River. The loss of West Point and 3,000 soldiers and all, all the artillery there would have been a devastating blow. Because in the fall of 1780, when that happened, and by this time, the war has been going on for five years, five years, uh, everything has wound down, uh, much to Washington's frustration. Not only does one of his best generals uh, turn traitor, but the American people have turned their back on this revolution. They, um, you know, they, they didn't want to pay the taxes to the British, so we we revolted, and then when it came to the war that we needed to win our freedom, uh, we weren't willing to pay the taxes. The, the Continental Congress did not have the power to directly tax the people, and uh, the, Washington's army was withering on the vine. The soldiers hadn't been paid for years, and, uh, uh, the, and recruitment levels were very low. It was looking really bad, but Washington had hope because in 1778, after the Battle of Saratoga, once again, up on that Hudson River, that corridor of water, that crucial fact, geographic factor, America had won with Benedict Arnold leading the way, really. And uh, th this victory was so stunning that it brought France into the, the, the war, transforming a colonial rebellion into a world war. And this meant that um, everything had changed for Washington's perspective. And I refer to the genius of Washington in, in the subtitle. And he was a genius, in the, not like a Hamilton, who was just a blazingly brilliant person. Washington had that ability to sort through the static of life and figure out what is the most important thing I need to do now. At the beginning of the revolution, it was, he wanted to desperately win the thing in the beginning. He, uh, back when he was in Boston, after he took over, after the Battle of Bunker Hill, he wanted to attack the British-occupied Boston, burn it to the ground if necessary, and just finish the thing. But it was crazy. He didn't have the gunpowder. He didn't have the men. And uh, his council of war every time would vo unanimously vote him down. This was not the Washington that stares at us from the, 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 the $1 bill. This was a guy in his 40s, fiery 
by temperament very aggressive. Eventually, however, a couple years into it, he began to realize I could lose it all by, with this aggra aggressive approach. I need to fight a defensive war, a war of posts, he called it. You know, basically the rope-a-dope. <laughs> you know, I'm in there, I will bother, annoy the British as I can, but I will not risk losing everything. The French come into the war on our side. And Washington immediately recognized the key to finishing this now is naval superiority. Now, we think of Washington as, as land-based, permanently attached to his horse. <laughs> but he grew up in Tidewater, Virginia. And uh, he, he, had, he grew up on the Rappahannock River, ended up living on the Potomac. His, at 14, he desperately wanted to become a British midshipman, but his mother prevented him from, from going. And his house, Mount Vernon, was named by his older stepbrother for a British admiral by that name. So uh, Washington had a schooner that was tied up to the wharf in front of his house. He understood the water. Uh, as, as at 19, he had sailed with his brother to Barbados and back. Uh, you know, he, that was his only blue water experience, but he, he knew of all that. Not that he necessarily trusted it with good reason. Because yes, in 1778, he says, we need naval superiority. Uh, only with the French Navy can we break the stranglehold that the British Navy has had on the Atlantic seaboard. Why, you know, the Americans could win a battle, but with the, the British Navy out there, uh, there was no way they could win a victory of the scale required to end this thing. Because a British naval ship, a ship of the line, was an extraordinarily sophisticated piece of 18th century technology. I mean, these were magnificent vessels. You know, there wasn't anything quaint and tall ship about these things. Uh, these were killing machines. Average ship of the line, was called a 74 because that was the number of cannons it had. You know, huge, they could, uh, a cannon that could fire a, a cannonball more than a mile. Uh, and uh, a 74 had a crew of 500 to 750 men. It took 2,000 oak trees to build one of these things. That's 56 acres of forest. And in a typical naval battle, you'd create a, a line of ships, a, a, a line of battle, in which the ships would, would be right one after the other, trying to create a floating version of a fortress. The other fleet would sail up to it, doing the same thing, and sometimes they were as close as a pistol shot, 100 yards away. And then they would just blast away at each other until one side faltered and they could then sail off. Uh, but, or, or there would be an, an annihilating defeat, which was rare but could happen. And, you know, this, 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 and this was all dependent on the wind and the currents and all these kinds of things, because the sea is a wilderness. A sea is beyond anyone's control, as Washington soon learned. The French Navy arrives in the summer of 1778. Yes, we're going to do it. They, uh, the, the British Navy was up the Delaware at the, at, in Philadelphia, evacuating the, the French army to, to bring them to uh, New York. It was a perfect opportunity for the French to catch them. It took them a ridiculously long time to cross the Atlantic, the British escape. Then they sail for New York. The British, much smaller British fleet is, is in New York Harbor. Washington says to the French admiral, come on, go in there, we can do this. But the French determined that the, the bar, sandbar at the harbor mouth made it too shallow for their deeper drafted ships and so they refused to go in. Washington was, oh, okay. But no, there's another shot at it, Newport. The, the, the French sail there and the British come to have a, a confrontation. It's looking like the battle to end all battles is going to happen and, and France has the advantage, this could end it. But then a storm on the verge, on, on perhaps a hurricane hits, blows everyone all which away and it doesn't happen. Washington's in despair. The French end up sailing down to the Caribbean. And why would they go to the Caribbean, you ask? Well, a colonial rebellion is now a world war. France is fighting on our behalf, but France has its own agenda. It's not in this just to help us. It's in this because it wants to 
put a very serious hurt into Britain because they'd been humiliated in the previous decade during the Seven Years' War where uh, they, they had been forced, they had lost Canada, and their ally, Spain, had also been uh, humiliated. They had lost Florida and Alabama, what's now Alabama to, to the French who now occupied Mobile and Pensacola. And, uh, you know, and, and so they, this is, was their priority. And we think of the, you know, the, the 13 states as the jewel in the empire's crown. Hardly so. Where the real money was, was in the Caribbean, the Sugar Islands. The island of Haiti, which is now Haiti, wasn't called Haiti then, which was French, provided a third of the exports to France. Sugar made that much money. The Caribbean was where now that this was a world war, the British were most interested and the French and the Spanish allies were most interested. And, Fran and so they w sailed down there and for the next two years, it's one battle after another in the Caribbean and no one comes up north to help Washington and the American army. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, we, we don't, Spain is not something, a country we think of with the American Revolution, but they had a very uh, important part what they realized, what, they had their agenda. They wanted to get Florida back. And so if they were going to help France, and France needed Spain because she had a big navy, but the French, the British Navy was the largest in the world. She needed Spain's help to create parity. And so there are all sorts of agendas floating around, all of which made sailing up the coast of North America and helping Washington's army not a priority. At one point, Washington laments, it's as if a chasm has formed between me and the French Navy. And then, in the fall of 1780, just weeks after uh, Benedict Arnold's betrayal, things began to shift down there in the Caribbean. And I'd like to now uh, read a section uh, from In the Hurricane's Eye that, that talks about what's happening. I, I had no idea that a book called In the Hurricane's Eye would actually come out in hurricane season. And this has been quite a, a, a summer and fall of hurricanes, of course, and you know, not too far from here. But it's been nothing compared to the fall of 1780. The first chapter of In the Hurricane's Eye begins uh, with the first of three hurricanes in 1780. Uh, uh, early October, it hits the waters between Jamaica and Spanish-held Cuba. We follow a French, uh, a English frigate named the Phoenix as the winds build to hurricane force and beyond. You know, the, ultimately the ship is washed up onto the rocky shore of Cuba, stern first, hurled up onto the rocks, what men are still alive, hang on for dear life. When daylight comes, they realize they're just 50 yards from shore. They throw out a rope and they all make it across and eventually save themselves. But, you know, this hurricane uh, sunk six ships uh, of the British fleet at that point. But that was, they, it was just getting started. On October 10th, what came to be called the Great Storm of 1780 hit the island of Barbados. By the following day, virtually every house, including those built of stone, had been leveled to the ground, and 6,000 inhabitants were dead. Many of the cannons at Fort James, which the young George Washington had visited almost 30 years earlier, were hurled more than 100 feet through the air. The extraordinary surge of water and wind carried a ship so far onto shore that it landed on top of the island's hospital. The hurricane-whipped rain stripped the trees of bark, indicating that the winds at Barbados must have exceeded 200 miles an hour. A similar scene of destruction occurred at St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Martinique, where a convoy carrying several thousand French troops was blown out to sea. One estimate puts the total death count of the great storm of 1780 at 22,000, making it the deadliest hurricane in recorded history. And then, on October 18, two days after a Spanish fleet of 74 ships bearing 4,000 soldiers under the command of General Don Bernardo de Galvez departed from Havana to attack Pensacola, a third hurricane struck. 
known today as Solano's hurricane for the admiral in charge of the fleet. The storm ravaged the Gulf of Mexico for three days and ultimately drove the remains of the Spanish fleet back to Cuba with dozens of vessels sunk and dismasted. Hundreds of soldiers and sailors drowned. Solano and Galvez reluctantly decided to postpone the attack until the following year. It would take the English, French, and Spanish months, if not years, to recover from the three hurricanes of October 1780, when British Admiral George Rodney, who'd spent the late summer and fall in New York, arrived at Barbados in early December. He was astounded by what he saw. Had I not been an eyewitness, he wrote to his wife, nothing could have induced me to have believed it. More than 6,000 persons perished and all the inhabitants ruined. The hurricane proved fatal to six of my squadron. The lesson was impossible to ignore. Given the seasonal dangers of the storm-battered string of islands, the best place for a navy in the summer and fall was anywhere but the Caribbean. Up until this point, France had viewed a naval expedition to the north on behalf of the United States as a possibility, but hardly a priority. After that horrendous October, a different attitude prevailed. I called this in the hurricane's eye because I think a hurricane is a wonderful metaphor for that year of Yorktown because it all unfolds in less than a year. Uh, and you know, we think of wars as, as linear, as each battle being a stepping stone to the, ult and in the case of the revolution, to our, our ultimate and fated victory. But it wasn't anything like that whatsoever. Instead of you know, a, 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 a determined chronology, this was a series of random events that happened up and down uh, the Atlantic seaboard involving a whole cast of characters with forces beyond anyone's control uh, swirling around. And, and, and the vortex in the eye of the hurricane stood Washington, who uh, saw that it was naval superiority we needed. It, he would be frustrated at times. He would be elated at times as this year unfolded. But he, it was his focus on that one L co line of conduct that would win this thing that made it happen. And so this, this book tells the story of that year. And I have kind of an alternative version uh, from the popular American version of the, the siege at Yorktown and the great victory that won us our independence. You know, the, the traditional victory focuses on Washington's relationship with French General Rochambeau, who is stationed in Newport with a small fleet of just seven ships of the line. And, they, and there were 5,000 soldiers. They were there to somehow help America. But they had been there since the summer of 1780, and nothing had happened. Washington was locked in a stalemate uh, uh, in New York with Sir Henry Clinton. And down in the south, in the Carolinas, there was stuff happening. There was Lord Cornwallis battling away, with, and Washington sent Nathaniel Green down there to, to try to deal with him in some way. They would fight in March one of the great battles of the American Revolution, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Uh, the Brit British would technically win, but Green would deliver a hurt that would um, uh, effectively uh, uh, make it make Cornwallis's retreat inevitable. And even though his army had been eviscerated, he decided in true British fashion to go on uh, the attack, move into Virginia, where he replaced none other than Benedict Arnold who had been sent down by Clinton in that winter and ravaged uh, Virginia, showing that he was probably the best general on both sides. He had uh, the, British, the, the war capital of Richmond in flames, sending Governor Thomas Jefferson running for his life. Uh, he was replaced by Cornwallis. And Cornwallis, uh, by this point, La Washington had sent Lafayette down there. And Lafayette, in a wonderful series of maneuvers, um, which were almost the embodiment of what of the philosophy that Washington had acquired of that, of that you know, rope-a-dope, harass him, but don't let yourself get caught. He did it to perfection. And then the summer kicked in. A summer in the tidewater was no time to fight fight battles, and Cornwallis would ultimately end up at Yorktown, at the end of the point formed by the York and James River, 
where he was ordered to uh, build a, 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 what would become a naval port. Uh, that, and so that's where he was. Now Washington was desperate to get the French Navy up here. But the French Navy, the French government, didn't want Rochambeau to tell Washington where Admiral de Grasse and 30 ships of the line was. Because what they feared was the American rebellion was about to collapse. They feared that if, the, if, if Washington couldn't get his troops and the state started to fracture, uh, that they'd have to evacuate Rochambeau's army with de Grasse's fleet. And so uh, can you imagine that scenario? And so they wanted to keep the, his movements a mystery. This drove Washington crazy. You know, he would say to Rochambeau, you know, what's going on? What's going on? Because what Washington wanted was he wanted uh, the French Navy to first go to New York. Perhaps they could attack Clinton there where there were more than 10,000 soldiers. If there could be a victory there, they would win it. Down in Virginia in the early summer of 1781, Cornwallis hadn't even gone out to Yorktown. There wasn't an opportunity for a great victory yet. And even if they decided to head south, he wanted the French Navy to transport their troops down there to march. Um, and so that was his hope. And then he, he reads in a newspaper that Admiral de Grasse is in the Caribbean. He confronts Rochambeau. What's going on here? Rochambeau says, don't worry. I've told him, you know, you'd like them to go to New York. Well, he, he, he told Ro Rochambeau, told de Grasse, no, I think you should go to the Chesapeake, which is where uh, de Grasse finally ended up going. Washington on August 14 is at his headquarters on the Hudson River. By this time, Rochambeau's army has marched from Newport to New York. They're together. And the tentative plan is to attack New York. Sir Henry Clinton in New York is all ready for them to attack. When they get the letter, de Grasse is sailing for the Chesapeake. Washington is irate. You know, but that, and, and there's a wonderful letter from uh, uh, two gentlemen who were there with him. And the, you know, they had never seen him act this way. And then they, uh, they, then they come back to have breakfast with him, and he is calm as anything. He's now resigned himself to it, and he says, what can you, because these were two, two, two guys were from Congress, what can you do to help me make this happen? This was Washington's great strength. He would feel, you know, he was emotional, but he never let those emotions get in the way of doing what was right for the country. And then, so he immediately started planning the march to Yorktown, 500 miles with an uh, army, many of the soldiers from New England that were not excited about the prospect of marching into Virginia in summer, where uh, the reputation was you would die there from yellow fever or any kind of fever. So uh, he knew he might have a potential rebellion on his hand, but he pulled it off. And then watch there, they make it to Philadelphia, all the while Clinton thinking they're going to attack New York. Only then does he realize, oh my gosh, they're going for Cornwallis. But Washington has not heard anything of de Grasse. Where is he? And then he gets the letter. He's riding a horse towards the head of Elk, the northern part of the Chesapeake, when he gets a dispatch saying de Grasse and 28 ships of the line has sailed into the Chesapeake. He's so, he turns his horse around, rides to Chester, uh, Pennsylvania, on the Delaware, where he knows Rochambeau is about to arrive with, with some of his soldiers, after, uh, officers, after reviewing the forts along the way. And they see someone on the waterfront as they approach who is jumping up and down, has his hat in one hand, a handkerchief in the other, and they're going, now who the heck could that be? That, that Washington would never do that. It's Washington. Uh, he is so elated, he just lets it go. And there's wonderful, it's a great scene, if I do say so myself. They hug, and then they head, start heading, marching down. And uh, they stop at Mount Vernon. Washington has not been to Mount Vernon in six years, since the entire revolution. There are four grandchildren he has never met. I mean, can you imagine? He and Rochambeau uh, throw out their, their charts and, and plan, plan uh, the siege of Yorktown. And then he sets off, and he's just a few miles down the road when he gets word that the British have, a British fleet has arrived. And de Grasse has sailed out to meet it, and no one knows what happened next. Okay, yes, there is the siege at Yorktown. I am here to tell you tonight that that was a great victory. 
but it was made possible by a naval battle, the most important naval battle in the history of the world given its ramifications. Most Americans don't give it much, much attention because no Americans participated in it. But this naval battle would determine the future of the United States. The British were sailing down from New York with a fleet almost as large as de Grasse to rescue Lord Cornwallis. If they could get into the Chesapeake, rescue Cornwallis, no problem. They'd get through the summer and probably, you know, it would be the end of America because there's just no way the war was go France was going to continue the war for another year. Admiral de Grasse, and I won't go into the details of the battle. That's why you have to buy the book. <laughs> But I will say, it is, it, you think it's going one way, you think it's going another. And, and this is a simplification, but for the first and last time in the history of the world, the French Navy would defeat the British. And uh, de Grasse would put a hurt into the fleet under Admiral de Graves, who would be forced to sail back to New York to repair his ships, just as Washington and Rochambeau arrived with their armies. The siege would begin. And about a month later, we would ha Cornwallis would be forced to surrender. The siege of New York, the siege of Yorktown, was a fait accompli because of the French naval victory. And in in the hurricane's eye, I wanted to put that naval battle where it belonged, in the center of the story. And you know, I wanted you know, and the Washington's emotions are amazing. You know, he is not the man of marble. This man felt deeply, and you know, I wanted him to have a high five moment. <laughs> you know, one of those, yeah, we did it. But uh, they win the, the the siege at Yorktown. But Washington's stepson, Jackie Custis, comes down with camp fever, uh, while the Washington is at his bedside when he dies. While the entire country is celebrating, he and Martha are back at Mount Vernon in mourning. And the revolution, the, the war doesn't immediately end. It will take two years for negotiations to finally result in a treaty. Not until November of 1783 would the British finally evacuate from New York. And during, and I think some of the most interesting part of, of this year of, of, of of the story is what happens that year because Washington's officers, it's been a great result, but they haven't been paid and Congress is not interested in paying them. And uh, they are threatening mutiny. They are threatening, and it's known as the Newburgh conspiracy because they were based in Newburgh, once again, on the Hudson. And uh, there, they are, there are plans that to march on Philadelphia and force Congress at gunpoint to pay them. This would be the military coup that would have ended uh, the United States as we know it today. Washington delivers a magnificent speech, keeps it from happening, and then, um, and then finally there is the evacuation. But his officers by the, who are, begin to leave are not happy with him. He has a, a very emotional goodbye at Francis Tavern with the, the staunch loyal uh, officers and then makes his way to to Annapolis. So fearful of being attacked by their own military, Continental Congress has moved from Philadelphia to Annapolis. <laughs> it just shows you. This country was a facade of a country. We were barely holding it together. And, Con and Washington, in December 23rd, surrenders his commission to Congress. When King George III heard that that was Washington's intention, to walk away from ultimate power, he told uh, the American-born painter Benjamin West, if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. Washington did do that. What he realized was that for this Republican experiment to work, he needed to step aside as military commander. And the first tentative steps of this country needed to be taken with the civil government in charge. Who knew what was ahead? And so, and it was very moving for me because I was writing, I was finishing this book right before Christmas. Washington, after surrendering his commission, arrives at Mount Vernon on Christmas Eve. Uh, he's got two aides and his, his enslaved manservant, Billy Lee, who has been with him for the entire war. It's been eight years. And by the way, I, I just really realized 
I, it took me eight years to write these three books. So, you know, it's, it's a long time. And he was finally home. And so ultimately, I, I would le just leave you with, you know, the, as Washington would say, it was truly a miracle that Yorktown occurred. But it was a naval battle that allowed it to happen. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yeah. Yes. I read somewhere that that the French Navy had set a deadline that something had to happen because they had to go back to France by a certain time because of the storms that on the Atlantic, the North the Atlantic. Yeah, there were there was all sorts of deadlines. Uh, you know, they they came they came up. Uh, to avoid the hurricane season, but you know they had an agenda, and and I said earlier, you know they were they needed to fulfill uh, Spain's uh, expectations as well, and the Spaniards that what they weren't able to sail up north to help us until the Spain Spain got back uh, Pensacola. There was the Battle of Pensacola in May of 1781, and that allowed De Grasse to sail north. And and by the way. You know, okay, so De Grasse is now ready to go, but he has no money. You know, and this is before cash transfer, bank transfers, and ATMs, and you needed the coins, the gold and silver coins. And he tried to get a loan from the planters of Haiti, who refused to do it because the French government had been slow to reimburse them in a previous instant. And so, and this, there's so many unheralded characters in this, uh, and one of them is a Spanish emissary named Francisco Saavedra who is advising uh, uh, de Grasse and all this. And, he, and de Grasse says, I can't go. I, don't, I, I just don't have the funds. So Vedra says, if you sail to Havana on your way north, I bet we can get the money. They okay, so the fleet sails to Havana. And one day, the citizens of, of Havana come up with 500,000 pesos. You know, tons of coins that are then distributed to the fleet, and only then does de Grasse sail north the Chesapeake in ultimate victory. So you can also argue that our independence is based on a loan from, from Havana. So, you know, I mean, this is the international nature of this. And so, yes, de Grasse had a timeline. He's there, and he, immediately, you know, he, he arrives on August 30th. And he immediately writes to Washington, okay, I'm here, but I, I got to be out of here uh, by early October because the Spaniards say, you can go up there. We'll cover the fort here in the Caribbean, but you got to be down to help us take Jamaica back from the British. And so de Grasse is just looking at his watch the whole time. And Washington says, there's no way we can do this in that amount of time. The siege begins. De Grasse is saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to be out of here. And, and finally... With Rochambeau playing a big role, just talking him down, say, look, just stay to the end of October, okay? Just stay to the end of October. Because without the French Navy there, they would lose, con they, they were, the, the army depended on the Navy to feed it. You know, that's how you got things around. If de, if, if de Grasse had sailed off, that would have been the end of it. Um, you know, it was that essential. Naval power was absolutely essential to all of this. And so it was tough. And, um, and so de Grasse had the timeline. And, you know, and then just as a coda to all this, you know, we think of de Grasse as a, a hero, great hero. And he should, he is. It was his Navy that won us uh, the victory that made it all happen. But the, he's not so in France because he would go to the Caribbean, uh, they and the Spaniards were ready to say, attack Jamaica, amassing a huge fleet. Uh, they're, they're sailing in that direction when who shows up but British Admiral Rodney. Now, Rodney was Britain's best admiral at this time. If he had been the head of the fleet uh, that met de Grasse earlier, he probably would have won. He had prostate problems, so he had to go to back to England for a surgery. He just, you know, who knew the, the fate of the world depended on Rodney's uh, prostate? But he was back, and he, um, he, he uh, humiliated the French Navy. Uh, de Grasse was forced to surrender his ship, his sword, to Rodney. And this 
made the attack on Jamaica impossible. It, and this happened in April of 1782. So, you know, months after, and when Washington heard this, he thought, oh my gosh, this could be the end of it. You know, they might come roaring back. He despaired. But the tide of opinion back in England had reached the point where it was time to get out. Thank goodness, because, I mean, it was, it could have, the French Navy was a shambles, and it could have all gone on. So anyways, it was tentative, and there was, the pressures were immense. Yes? Very good question. Why did Cornwallis not cross the York? You know, he, if, you know, hindsight it obviously is everything, but when 28 ships of the line sail in, that is a sign that you're in trouble. And if he had uh, simply either crossed the York or retreated overland into the Carolinas, he would have been fine. Um, in the, you know, he would have, his army would have escaped because Lafayette was there with a much smaller army, and Wa Washington and Rochambeau had not yet arrived. There'd be weeks before they got down there. He had a window where he could have gotten out of there. But he claimed it was Sir Henry Clinton back in New York's promises that he would get support from the, the British Navy that uh, kept him there. Even after the French victory, uh, he, Cornwallis was under the impression that they'd repair their ships, sail down, bulldoze their way through, and somehow save him. That was crazy. I mean, with the French ensconced in the, the Chesapeake, that wasn't going to happen. It was really an excuse. Um, but Washington couldn't understand it. Why is Cornwallis just sitting there? Finally, the night before he would ultimately surrender, he decides to make a desperate attempt to cross the York with the... Um, with the, 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 the core of his, his army. It's a desperate gamble. It's night, they load up uh, seven barges and they begin, they, they begin to cross the York and a terrible storm comes in. <laughs> High winds, lightning, they have to give it up. And then the next day they surrender. And so it is one of the great mysteries. Now you had another question? Yeah. Eustatius, yes. Um, I understand that the reason the whole English fleet did not go back, but you did all go to Chesapeake, is because they found a huge bounty of materials through there, and so they decided that would work more to go to Chesapeake. Yeah. Um, you, the St. Eustatius would play, and this is a little, it's now called Stacia. I, I actually sailed down there with my wife and a friend, and um, we looked at it. This was a Dutch island, um, uh, and it was supposedly neutral, but it was how we got all the weapons and gunpowder we needed was through there, and this drove the British crazy, you know. And finally, by 1781, war was declared between the two of them. Rodney, Rodney hears this. And, um, and Rodney was, a, uh, was broke. Uh, he he uh, had been bankrupted uh, uh, and, and actually was in debt for jail in Paris when the, the uh, revolution <laughs> broke out, but somehow got back. But anyways, he saw an opportunity to personally enrich himself because an admiral would get a good percentage of the bounty. And so they sail in there and start the, the, the Dutch com immediately surrender, and he spends the next months collecting booty. Uh, meanwhile, de Grasse arrives from France and sails into Martinique. Rodney's highest priority was to stop de Grasse, but he sent his underling um, uh, uh, to, to deal with it, and de Grasse was able to, to arrive. And so that was a huge distraction for him. Uh, but he was, that was all done by the time of, of the buildup, the direct buildup to the Battle of the Chesapeake. It was then that Rodney's health began to bother him, and he was forced to go to England uh, just before the Battle of the Chesapeake. And so, you know, all, the, all of this tentative nature. Yes. Yes. Very good question. Did the army ever get paid? Not all that was deserved, but Washington knew he had to pay them something 
if he was going to get them all the way down south. But he didn't have the money. Where was he going to get the money? Well, remember that loan from Cuba? When uh, they hear, when Rochambeau hears that de Grasse has that money, he says to Washington, okay, if that's coming, I can give you a loan with which you can pay your troops. And so at Head of Elk, you know, just at the northern tip of the Chesapeake, they take out these casts of coin, knock off the heads, and all these coins <laughs> scatter, and uh, uh, the men are paid one after the other. And as, uh, there's a wonderful account from a private, you know, who's been there through the war for years, and he says, it's the only pay I ever got um, during the American Revolution was then. And once again, it was uh, the Spanish with the help of the French that made that happen. Yes? This will be the last question. I think we're. Yeah. About how long the war dragged out for Washington and, yeah. and the Americans. It dragged out just as long for the British. Did, did you find that the British government and the British people were also tiring of the war? Absolutely. Yeah. It, you know, and that's, it was really the length of the war that began to work to our benefit with this victory because when King George heard about this, um, it was like, okay, we'll just keep going. <laughs> And, you know, and if they had, they would have worn uh, France down, particularly given their, their terrible defeat at the uh, Battle of the Saints um, in, in April of 1782. But this had been going on forever. And uh, it, uh, it would bankrupt France. Uh, their revolution in the next decade would be a direct result of their helping us in our revolution, which is one of the, the great and tragic ironies when it comes to the king of France. He would lose his head for his, um, you know, and it would be their, their rev, the, rev, the, the forces unleashed by our revolution would, you know, infect their people. And uh, uh, if you want to call it an infection. And, and so, you know, once again, it had there, but also in Britain, what Britain had was a much more sophisticated economy. Uh, you know, they had the beginnings of a modern economy with, they, with debt and all this kind of thing. So they were able to, to hang in there for a tremendously long time. I mean, that's what Washington feared that, you know, at one point, he, you know, he, he really understood, you know, he was way beyond a general. He was someone who understood the geopolitical, financial stuff. And he said, it is uh, 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 Britain's economy that we are fighting. <laughs> you know, we, we just have nothing. We're, you know, and this is where you can see Hamilton laying the groundwork, what will be the, be the bank. Um, and you know, Hamilton is his closest aide and writing m many of his letters and speeches and all this. And you know, they're all beginning to figure out what will ultimately happen with this country is all beginning during this war. And, um, and yes, it was, it was everyone was exhausted. This was, this was not, you know, the great, yeah, we smack down. This was like uh, two fighters in the final round, punch drunk, staring, you know, who will be the one to fall <laughs> and let the other win. And, and as Washington would later say, soon after Yorktown, you know, you look at the series of events and if you don't believe in God, <laughs> look at how we won because there is no other way. Well, thank you very much.